Welcome to worship in the Unitarian Universalist Church of Charlotte. Welcome to visitors. Welcome to our members. Welcome to all who come here seeking, hoping, imagining, wondering. Welcome to all who come here sorrowing, hurting, anxious, adrift. In the words of my colleague, the Unitarian Universalist minister, Ann Barker, May the strength of this time together help us to walk forward. May the wisdom of this experience help us to know our path. May we have the courage to return as often as necessary until our way is clear. May we have the perseverance together to see it through. May we cause it to be so. Welcome to all who now here gather. This is a holy place in which we gather. The light of the earth brought in and held, touched then by our answering light, the flame on a chalice, the flicker of a candle, the lamps of our open faces brought near.
invite you to think briefly about what you know about the mid-19th century in the United States, what your sense of that time frame might be. And then consider that Unitarian minister Theodore Parker in 1853 preached his sermon of justice and conscience in which he said this. Look at the facts, the facts of the world. You see a continual and progressive triumph of the right. I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure it bends towards justice. I'm sure. Things refuse to be mismanaged long. 112 years later, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in March of 1965 would pick up on Theodore Parker's metaphor. I know you are asking today, how long will it take? How long will justice be crucified and truth bear it? I come to say to you this afternoon, King said to those gathered, however difficult the moment, however frustrating the hour, it will not be long because truth crushed to earth will rise again. How long? Not long. Because no lie can live forever. How long? Not long. Because you shall reap what you sow. How long? Not long. Truth forever on the scaffold. Wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future. And behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. How long? Not long. Because the arc of the moral universe is long. But it bends toward justice. King was in part not only referring to Theodore Parker's defining metaphor, but was quoting from James Russell Lowell's poem, Become Him. It's a hymn that 31 years ago last month was sung at my ordination. And now I invite us to sing it again.
I offer you this reading by ta Coates, author of Between the World and Me, from a December 2016 interview on the Ezra Klein Show. At the end of the day, it all works out. Or maybe to put it less condescendingly, that we're on the right side of history and the arc of the moral universe bends to justice. That's just something I don't share. The sense of destiny that it will, I just don't share it. There's ample evidence it might not. That's where I come down. your happiness I want most of all and for that I do anything at all oh mercy me if you want the best of it or the most of it If there's anything I can do it all Now come on shotgun bright What makes me envy your life Faceless, nameless, innocent, blameless and free What's that like to be? Oh, motherland, cradle me. Close my eyes, lullaby me to sleep. Keep me safe, lie with me. Stay 
beside me, don't go, don't go, motherland, cradle me. Keep me safe, fly with me, stay beside me, don't go, don't go. James Clifford Leach and Claude Sawyer Fox, my grandfathers, were two very different men. My paternal grandfather, Tippy, was a big, gregarious man with an engaging personality, a loud laugh, and a stubborn assumption that everyone welcomed hearing his opinions. <clears throat> From Tippy, I got my love of baseball and a strong dose of obstinacy. <laughs> my maternal grandfather, Papa, was more of a still waters running deep kind of person. Steady, calm, deeply introspective with all of his churn on the inside. From Papa, I got my love of nature, my capacity for wonder, and a delight in language. For all of their obvious variances, they shared certain qualities, none more apparent than their capacities to tell a story. They were both engaging raconteurs. Tippy recounting seeing my grandmother descending a stairway at the University of Georgia and knowing that he would marry her, even though they hadn't actually met. <laughs> Papa quietly unveiling the account of packing the wooden trunk now at the foot of our bed and boarding a train for college, the first and only in his family to do so. From both of them, I got a love of stories, a way of often thinking of things in terms of a narrative and a tendency to contextualize facts in a certain loquacious, some might rightly say rambling way of communicating. It often feels a bit inelegant to me to spill the beans too quickly. Why rush to the factual destination when we can enjoy a narrative journey along the way? That's one of the things that attracted me to ministry. <laughs> Religion is rarely conveyed in brief declarations or terse definitions originating in that time when our primordial forebears first began to wonder, religion has most often been passed along in multivalent myths, narratives, parables, stories of one kind and another. It was in the church of my childhood and adolescence that I heard the best, most imaginative, truly 
unbelievable stories of all. So when in my study of philosophy, I came across John S. Dunn's core question in the very first sentence of the preface to his book, Time and Myth, it made a great deal of sense to me. Dunn asks, what kind of story are we in? What kind of story are we in? While some gravitate to the more impressive precision of business or law or science or music, my own core constitution, stoked by my beloved grandfathers, is to look for and find meaning as a narrative, as a story. So asking Dunn's question rings true for me. What kind of story are we in? For most of my adult life, I've had not so much an answer as a response. I've been convinced that a certain story makes sense. In fact, that it makes the most sense. It is a narrative tapestry made up of many different strands woven into a cogent description of how things are. For example, 19th century Unitarian James Freeman Clark's version of the story was encapsulated as the final part of what he called the theology of the future. Clark asserted with the unfettered optimism of classic late 19th century liberalism that the story we are in is one of the, quote, continuity of human development in all worlds or the progress of humankind onward and upward forever. Another strand comes in the form of James Milton's question, who ever knew truth put to the worse in a free and open encounter? A confidence echoed in Thomas Jefferson's assurance that truth will do well enough if left to shift for herself. Then there was the strand expressed in Dostoevsky's assertion, beauty will save the world. A belief amplified in Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Nobel lecture, in which the great writer said that in the consummate truth and goodness of beauty, age-old Violence will topple. It will topple in defeat. What kind of story are we in woven together alongside similarly confident strands? I came to believe that bolstered by truth and beauty, the human story is one about development, progress on a trajectory that points onward and upward forever. Human progress is not only predictable, it is inevitable. Now, my own version of this story has been tempered by a not insignificant sense of the tragic. I have always wrestled with a certain pall, cast by an at times overly attentive awareness of all the ways life is unjust. While that also motivated me toward ministry, this deep sense of the tragic has made ministry harder on me and on others at times than perhaps it has needed to be. But the story persisted, and it was the story. So when I arrived here 15 years ago, it was one I told in one way and another. Not infrequently, I have appealed to a version of that story told first by our religious forebear, Theodore Parker, and then made more accessible by our national prophet gone for a full half century now, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. You've heard me proclaim it. 
The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Oh, the times, these times, any times, may be marked by pain and suffering, inequities and injustice, but take heart. Have faith. The ark will bend. It absolutely will bend toward justice. We will develop. We will progress. And at some point within or perhaps beyond our lifetimes, carried on the wings of truth and beauty, we will enter a time defined by peace, informed by justice. While often appealing to their essential metaphor, my personal faith in that story has been quite different from that of both Parker and King. Their confidence was underwritten by a belief in a God whose purposes, while mysterious, were at least known enough to assure us that God's ways will ultimately prevail. My own telling of that story has been rooted in another sort of faith. Mine has been faith in humankind, in the wonder of our remarkable species. That was why humanism, substantive, rational, positive humanism of a regrettably rare sort, finally paved the way for me to enter into Unitarian Universalism. I came here as your minister with that worldview intact, with a story to tell of the arc of the moral universe bending toward justice, because we humans have been and would continue bending it that way. So, for example, when early on I disclosed here the depth of my commitment to marriage equality and my conviction that I should not sign anyone's marriage license until I could sign everyone's marriage license, I did so declaring that the ark would bend. When we walked together through the valley of despair in those difficult days of Amendment 1, I was sustained by this story, believing that history would prove us right, as it has on that particular issue. That story provided a foundation, as firm as one is ever going to feel for me. The currency of my convictions and commitment was backed by the gold standard of that story, making any and all investments of time and of energy worthy and worthwhile. After all, I am not acting alone in some naive, even foolish, futile, tilt at windmills. I am acting in concert with the grand and inspiring way that things will be when the onward and upward trajectory of human progress at last intersects with the bending arc of the moral universe. My friends, I stand before you today deeply aware that the bold and beautiful tapestry that is this defining story, one that in so many ways has been the defining story of my ministry, began several years ago to fray. The harder I tried to mend it, the more it seemed to fray. I have no single factor to which I can point, 
no trauma, no tragedy so profound that my faith was lost. I experienced no one disappointment that caused me to reject a story in which I have been so deeply invested. But gradually, I began considering truly unsettling questions. What if James Freeman Clark told the wrong story? And there isn't continuity in human development. What if we don't necessarily progress onward and upward forever? What if Milton and Jefferson told the wrong story and truth isn't guaranteed to prevail? What if Dostoevsky and Solzhenitsyn told the wrong story and beauty won't save the world? What if, what if Parker and King, for all of their faith, told the wrong story? And the arc of the moral universe doesn't bend toward justice. Whatever else contributed to my doubts, I began to suspect that privilege may have allowed me to see possibility where others saw only a recurring cycle of oppression. That privilege may have allowed me to see causes for hope where others saw only confirmation of their hope-deprived station in life. That privilege may have allowed me to continue to see what my own history and my own needs had for so long made me accustomed to see. What kind of story are we in? What if it is simply a cycle circling through the same sorts of injustices? What if it's a wildly undulating course in which mountaintops of accomplishment lead back down into valleys of setback and reversal? What if the arc bends downward? What if we're pointed not toward some beauty-filled denouement, but toward our ultimate demise? What kind of story are we in? I'd love to tell you that I've gotten this all worked out. That I've rewoven the tapestry. That I fixed its phrase. And I'm now ready to pronounce again that we humans are headed onward and upward. But for this decade and a half, I've tried to be honest with you, to share the hope and the hurt authentically. I can't now cross my fingers and simply write off my own struggle. The truth is, I'm considerably more inclined to tell the story we heard earlier from Ta-Nehisi Coates. When considering Parker and King's claim about the Ark, Coates asserts, that's just something I don't share. The sense of destiny that it will, I just don't share it. There's ample evidence that it might not. To quote Ta-Nehisi Coates, that's where I come down. What then do I do? If my feeble, fallible efforts to contribute to the cause of justice aren't backed by some story of its eventual arrival, can I continue to listen and learn, build relationships, and following the lead of the most marginalized, 
act on behalf of the cause of justice, if progress isn't inevitable, is a long, long, long investment in transformation, at best a long shot gamble, and at worst the buying of the worthless junk bonds of self-deception. Shortly before my arrival here 15 years ago, I read something quite unlikely for me, to which I have returned again. It was, of all things, an article in The New Yorker about a 20th century economist named Frank Knight. Knight wrote about uncertainty in business decisions. Uncertainty doesn't have to lead to paralysis. The article explained Knight believed that, the, that businesses prosper only when their executives are willing to act in spite of it. Hunkering down is no more rational than acting boldly. That's a strand in a new story that I'm searching for a way to tell. Hunkering down is no more rational than acting boldly. If I'm honestly uncertain about whether the art bends or not, then recoiling, pulling back, sitting it out makes no more sense than continuing to do what I believe makes some difference. Here, then, is where I am comforted by writer, filmmaker, activist Susan Sontag. The likeliness that your acts of resistance cannot stop the injustice. The likelihood that your acts of resistance cannot stop the injustice does not exempt you, she declared, from acting in what you sincerely and reflectively hold to be the best interest of your community. Even if the odds are long, continuing to act is advisable, maybe even imperative. That's a strand in a new story. I'm searching for a way to tell. And then as a latecomer to the writings of Rebecca Solnit, I'm taking solace in her admission. Hope, she says, doesn't mean denying difficult realities. Hope, she says, is not the belief that everything was, is, or will be fine. Hope, she says, locates itself in the premises that we don't know what will happen. And that in the spaciousness of uncertainty is room to act. That's a strand in a new story. I'm searching for a way to tell. What an honor earlier this year to welcome Bree Newsom to this pulpit. In an article for the momentous new Atlantic Monthly retrospective on the life and legacy of Dr. King, Bree writes this. In my current work as a community organizer in North Carolina, the other activists and I operate by a principle we refer to as seven generations. The concept which we adapted from the Iroquois Confederacy means we understand that the work we're doing has gone on for seven generations and will continue for seven more. So Bree writes, the movement lives because of the many people, places, and generations that breathe life into it. Oh, I need that strand. I need that strand in my new story as well. So, <laughs> frayed, worldview and all, I'm continuing to listen, learn, build relationships, and act. I'm doing so 
while still grieving. The loss of the story that guided me. It was easier when I imagined an eventual outcome. But I also recognize with ever clearer clarity that despair, that despair is an option only for the privileged. For if enough is at stake, then giving up is never a choice, no matter how long the odds. And to be honest, as an undeniable inheritance from an ornery, intractable grandfather, I'm just a little too obstinate to give up now. I've always thought about how we make meaning of our lives from the stories we tell. And those stories can change over time as we give different meanings to them. I was 13 when Martin Luther King was killed. I remember that his death affected my parents deeply. I personally only understood that his life would come to mean a lot more to me in the ensuing years. But that's not the story I want to tell. <clears throat> this story is about me. It was just a year later when I was in the eighth grade. Maybe you've heard it before. I was recruited by a reporter from our local newspaper to participate in an experiment. A few black kids would join a few white kids who happened to be Unitarian and try to gain entry to a local roller skating rink. Some of you may remember those crummy open air buildings with the hard wood floors, blaring music, a few people hugging the sides who could barely stay upright, and the show offs twirling around in the middle. But it was much better than trying to skate on bumpy streets in our neighborhoods. So when our group showed up, the owners informed us that you had to have a membership. That was news to me, but apparently I had already filled out my little index card and paid my 35 cents that they kept in their little file box. I didn't realize that the black kids I now went to school with had never been allowed in. I did know that my parents would have been quite disturbed if they knew I had been patronizing a segregated business. But that's another story. The fact is that I stood there with these young African Americans watching the scene unfold. I was one of the actors waiting for the owner's decision. I couldn't believe it. He was unflappable. I could skate, but they couldn't. In the end, we could only walk away. 
Now the reporter had his story with photos that appeared in the newspaper the next day, and I was proud to have played the part of an activist. The roller skating rink closed down sometime that year without much fanfare. Fast forward about 47 years. I'm talking to my 95-year-old dad, who's looking forward to the election of the first female president. I'm telling him about the work we're doing here, about how proud I am that we have a minister who's heavily involved in the community, and I'm suggesting that things aren't going so well as our city and country are struggling with so many injustices. This may be too much for him to hear as he replies, but they've made a lot of progress. I know he remembers the late 50s in Oakland when my mother had to stand up to our neighbors who had insisted that we not sell our house to a black family, when they picketed in front of a segregated cafeteria in Tennessee, when people of color weren't allowed to join the country club. We've done a lot of learning here this year and we're far from finished. I'm now forced to give my stories new meaning as with the one I told through the eyes of a 14 year old. I told it the way I experienced that day. My privilege allowed me to feel righteous and indignant. I don't remember any of the well-meaning adults gathering the young people together afterwards to talk about how we felt about being rejected or included because of the color of our skin. What about my young black friends? I wonder now if they knew what they were up against that day. If allowed, I wondered what I could have learned from them about what they faced every day. None of that had occurred to me until now. Welcome to today's service. We're honored to have guests with us. Our members would like to greet you following the service so that we might do so. If you're visiting, please raise your hand and keep it up. Welcome. Members, please take note of our guests seated near you. After the service, invite them to join you for coffee and conversation in Freeman Hall. Should it enhance your experience of future services, you can find both a large print order of service and a personal hearing assistance device on the table at the entrance to the sanctuary. If you'd like to learn more about us, please fill out a yellow card and place your completed card in an offering basket when they are passed later in the service. Members with a life event to share can do so on the reverse side of the card. You'll find them along with offering envelopes on the clipboards at the end of the row. Please begin passing them down your row now. Some returning visitors may be interested in hearing about how to become a member. If so, talk with our membership coordinator, Kelly Green, here. Her contact information is on the back of your order. Again, welcome to each of you. I'm agnostic about whether or not the ark bends. <laughs> I've tried to share with you honestly, as deeply as I know how, my own personal story, where I am in this, what it means to try to do what I do. I'm interested to share that not so much so that you can know and really not much at all so that you can grade or evaluate my story, but to invite you to think about your story about the story you would tell, about the sense that you make. Whether or not the art bends, I'm heartened. To look around this room and through this congregation and know all of what you are doing in so many ways. To tell the truth, to act in goodness, and to create beauty. Justin Parmenter, thank you.
for telling the truth. Stand up one second. If you hadn't read this man's editorial from today in The Observer, do yourself a favor and look at that. Thank you. I, I don't know whether Jefferson had it right. I suspect he didn't, that truth left alone will shift on its own, but I'm glad somebody's telling the truth. And I suspect some people are hearing it. And I look around this room and I recognize so many ways. Don't discount what you're doing. Doesn't have to be heroic. And please don't discount the ways you're bringing beauty to this world. That's why we're here. And to create other opportunities together, some of which are in your order. I'm not going to read them to you. We are the givers and the recipients. So now we will both give and receive the offering with gratitude.
During this time, I invite you to close your eyes and be aware of the breath that sustains you. I offer this meditation by Kathleen McTee. Here in the refuge of this Sabbath home, we turn our busy minds towards silence and our full hearts toward one another. We move together through the mysteries, the bright surprise of birth and the shadowed questions of death. In our slow walk between the two, we will be wounded and we will be showered with grace, amazing, unending. Even in our sorrows, we feel our lives cradled in holiness we cannot comprehend. And though we each walk within a vast loneliness, the promise we offer here is that we do not walk alone. This is a holy place in which we gather, the light of the earth brought in and held, touched then by our answering light, the flame on a chalice, the flicker of a candle, the lamp lamps of our open faces brought near. In this place of silence and celebration, solemnity and music, we make a sanctuary and name our home. Into this home, we bring our hunger for awakening. We bring compassionate hearts and a will toward justice. Into this home, we bring the courage to walk on after hard losses. Into this home, we bring our joy and gratitude for ordinary blessings. By our gathering, we bless this place. In its shelter, we know ourselves blessed. So may it be. Let us join together as we affirm our faith. May the strength 